Yat A. Mark Charles, you know, yeah. Tsin Bake Dinan, the Slant, the Tohiglini Bashachin, Tsin Bake Dinan Bashache, the Totachini Bashanella. In the Navajo culture, when you introduce yourself, you always give your four clans. We're a matrilineal people, our identities come from our mother's mother. So um, my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and so I say Tsin Bake Dinan, the which translated means I'm from the Wooden Shoe people. My father's mother, my second clan, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that float together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Bake Dine'a. And my fourth clan, my father's father, is Totochitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. Before we go any further, we did this last night, but I like to do this every, every word that I speak, because I just want to acknowledge and honor the Lenape people. Um, these were the original people of this land. These were the people who hunted and fished and farmed and, and gathered here, uh, lived with their families. And these were the people who were removed or who were um, marginalized and oppressed so that the white settlement could be built here. Um, I, I think it's very important that we do what we did last night, which is to give space for the host people of our land to speak. I was so grateful to hear three of the chiefs um, tell extensive stories about their land, about their lives, about their communities because it's important for us to recognize this. It's important for us to remember these lands weren't discovered. Um, it's important for us to remember that there were hosts on this land long before Columbus got lost at sea. And um, so I, I'm very grateful for uh, the, the gathering here to give space to the Lenape chiefs, and I honor them and their people for uh, the way they have stewarded these lands for so many hundreds, if not even thousands of years. In the next two hours, two and a half hours, we're going to be here till about noon, um, we are going to go through American history and the history of the church. And I am quite certain I will say several things in the next two hours that will shock you, that will surprise you, that will even make your stomach churn. Um, at some point, you may want to stand up and walk out. At another point, you may want to throw something at me. Um, resist all of those urges. We'll Stay in the dialogue, stay engaged. We're going to have a few breaks throughout to allow ourselves to decompress as we go through this history. But we're going to get to a better place, but we first have to understand a lot of things that we've never been told or that we've intentionally suppressed. And so um, I always tell people, you cannot understand the history of America unless you understand the history of the church. We say that we're a, a nation that has a separation of church and state. We say that we're a nation that uh, allows or gives space for pluralism. But our history is very strikingly um, rooted in the what I would call the heretical understanding of Christendom and which came out of a perversion of the Christian faith. And so one of the things we have to understand is how did this perversion happen? What are the roots that came from that faith, and how do these things influence us today? And so I want to go all the way back. Um, I, I start my lecture usually with the first through third century church, but I want to actually go back to the teachings of Jesus. Um, so when Jesus came into this world, he had a challenge that he was presented with, which is he was coming to the Jewish people. The Jewish people had a land covenant with the God of Abraham. According to their land covenant, whenever they were obedient to God, he would bless them and they would flourish on their land. Whenever they were disobedient and they ran after their gods, he would exile them from their lands and he would punish them and they would remove them from their lands. So their land, their relationship with their land was a barometer of their relationship with God. And w at the time of Jesus' birth, they had a bad reading on their barometer. They were under the oppression of the Roman government. They were not allowed to worship freely. They were not allowed to, to live freely as Jews. And so they were not, while not fully banished from their land, they definitely were not living the, the life that they had intended to live. And so many Jews, most of the Jews, were waiting for what was going to be the coming of a Messiah who was going to come in a political and an imperial fashion and restore the fortunes of the nation of Israel, restore them back to the greatness of the kingdom of David. And so this was the environment that Jesus came into. And so he had, to, he had to guard against this. And so he was born. Yes, his birth was announced by angels. Yes, there were, there were wise men and gifts and celestial words in the sky. But he was born in a barn. And he grew up as a refugee in Egypt. And there was this 
great deal of expectation that he was going to play this political imperial role. And even when he was first tempted by Satan, early on in his ministry, Satan took him up to the top of a high, of a high place and showed him the kingdoms of the world and said, if you bow down to me, I will give these to you because he thought the goal was earthly kingdoms. Jesus said no, and he walked away. One day he was out with his followers, and he stole a lunch from a small kid and fed 4,000 people. <laughs> and the, the, they were so excited that they wanted to make him king right there. They came to make him king by force. But he walked away. No, this isn't my goal. One day he was out, and he had, he had healed a widow's son. He had healed the, do, the, the servant of a centurion. He had cared for the poor and cast out demons, and this so bewildered, even John the Baptist, who came announcing Jesus' coming, John was so bewildered, he was in prison, he heard about what this Messiah was doing, and it so did not mix with what he expected the Messiah to be doing, that he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, hey, are you the one we're looking for, or should we wait for somebody else? I love Jesus' reaction, which is he turned around and he healed more sick people. He gave sight to more of the blind. He helped more of the poor. He helped more widows. And then he turned around and said to John's disciples, go back and tell your master what you've just seen. And blessed is the man who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus was trying to change expectations. Even when he stood before Pilate, Pilate said to him, don't you know? He's trying to get him to answer some questions. He says, don't you know I have the authority to kill you or to set you free? Jesus scoffs at him. You have no authority. The only authority you have is what my father gave to you in heaven. My kingdom's not from this earth. If it were, my servants, the angels, would come and set me free. My kingdom's from somewhere else. And so he allowed himself to be killed. Because his kingdom wasn't of this earth. Jesus was adamant. He had multiple opportunities throughout his ministry to establish a political, earthly, imperial, Christian kingdom. And he walked away every single time. He didn't come to be king. He didn't come to be president. He didn't come to, to lead a political or imperial movement. He came to lay down his life. He came as a living sacrifice. He came to raise up disciples. He came to plant a church. And so in the first through third, third centuries, when you joined this church, this church of Jesus Christ, you knew that you were standing in opposition to empire. You knew that there was a good chance the empire would hunt you down and either persecute you or maybe even kill you because of your membership in this church. You became a member of this church through your baptism, through your confession, through your discipleship, and through your community. And when you joined this church, you knew that your life was in danger, was threatened by the empire. Now, in the 4th century, Constantine becomes emperor of Rome. And while he's emperor, he becomes a Christian. And he decides to Christianize Rome. He's a baby Christian, doesn't understand the teachings of Jesus. And he decides to Christianize Rome. This fundamentally changes what it means to be the church. Now instead of joining the church through your baptism, your confession, your discipleship, and your community, now you join the church because you're a citizen of the empire. Fundamentally changes what it means to be a member of the church. So the theologians, the church fathers of the day, had a choice. Do they speak prophetically to this heretical teaching, or do they collude with it? This is the decision that they're faced with. So in, in, the fourth, in the fifth century, we have Augustine begins to develop what's called a just war theory. Now, I use the fact that we have a just war theory. The purpose of the just war theory was twofold. First, it was to fight wars more justly because now they're being fought by a Christian empire. Second, they were to justify how the citizens of this empire could justify going off and killing in the name of the empire. This was a brand new phenomenon. They never had this before. And so they needed a just war theory. So I use the fact that a just war theory exists as proof that the church fathers, the theologians of the day, decided to collude with Christendom rather than to speak prophetically to it. They were trying to find a way to make this thing work. But if you remember Jesus, whenever he was invited or tempted to collude with empire, 
he responded very strongly. So when he's coming out of Samaria with James and John, the Samaritans are probably the reason the, ro- the Jews are being judged. They're worshiping other gods. They're intermarrying. They're not worshiping in the temple. They're worshiping on this mountain. They're probably one of the reasons why they're being oppressed by the Romans because of the breaking of the land covenant. And James and John are probably feeling pretty good because they went with Jesus to the Samaritan village and they spoke to them and they were rejected by the Samaritans. And James and John are kind of excited walking out and they say to Jesus, can we be the ones to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Remember, this is how the Old Testament works, right? You disobey God, he sends you a prophet. If you listen to the prophet and repent, God blesses you and forgives you. If you reject the prophet, It's fire and brimstone. Frequently throughout the Old Testament, we see fire raining down from heaven because people didn't listen to the prophets. So James and John aren't asking anything outside the box here. This is how it works. And they're asking Jesus, I mean, who would want to be the one to be the person who called down fire from heaven, right? And Jesus turns and rebukes them. No, that's not what we're doing. And then he takes them to another Samaritan village. Peter one day tries to collude with empire and tells Jesus, you don't have to die. You don't have to be crucified. Jesus turns around and calls him Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You are not on the side of God, but of men. Whenever Jesus is invited to collude with empire, he responds very, very strongly, aggressively, jealously. And so I was wondering, where is the point in Augustine's writings where Jesus would call him Satan, right? If he's colluding with empire, where is the pivot point where Jesus would would read it and say, oh, Augustine, come on, you're off the rails here. You are not on the side of God, but of men. I read through his just war teachings. I couldn't find that point. I read through his teachings on the two kingdoms. I couldn't find that point. Augustine seems fairly clear. The kingdom of God, Christendom is not, uh, the kingdom of man, Christendom is not the kingdom of God. He's very clear about that. But he also seems to say, but it's better than being persecuted. So let's try and make this thing work. Now, about a year ago, I was reading through, I was about ready to teach at the Vancouver School of Theology. And I was going to give a a week-long lecture series on the Doctrine of Discovery. And I really wanted to find that that point in his writings. And so I was reading some more of his books and and going down, following some rabbit trails I was finding. And I came across a book that he wrote towards the end of his ministry called On the Correction of the Donatists. Now, the Donatists are a heretical group. They're teaching heresy. They're leading people astray. They've been kind of a thorn in Augustine's side his entire life. And in this book, chapter 5 of this book, he is wrestling with what is the role of a Christian king in a Christian empire. This is a brand new phenomenon. They've never had this before. And he concludes that the role of the king is to serve the Lord by preventing and chastising with religious severity all those acts which are done in opposition to the commandments of the Lord. He says the Christian king in the Christian empire serves the Lord by enforcing with suitable rigor such laws as ordain what is righteous and punishes what is the reverse. This does not sound like Jesus. In chapter 6, he goes on, and he says it's indeed better that men should worship God by sound teaching than be driven to it by fear of punishment or pain. For many have found advantage and first being compelled by fear or pain so that they might afterwards be influenced by sound teaching. So Augustine is concluding the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to use the resources of the state through fear, punishment, and pain to compel people to worship God. If Jesus had no problem calling St. Peter Satan, I'm sure he would have no problem whatsoever calling St. Augustine Satan. What are you thinking? You are off the rails. Get behind me. You are not on the side of God, but of men. This collusion with empire morphs into what we call the Crusades. The Crusades are about expanding the empire as well as protecting Jerusalem. In the 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 12th century, Thomas Aquinas is writing about the heretics. Again, what do we do with the heretics? And he concludes that basically he says, if 
the secular state has the right to kill people who break men's laws, how much more right do the church have, does the church have to kill people who break God's laws? He says it's a much quicker matter to corrupt the faith which quickens the soul than forge money which supports temporal life. Wherefore, if forgers of money and other evildoers are forthwith condemned to death by the secular authority, how much more reason is there for heretics, as soon as they are convicted by, of heresy, to not only be excommunicated, but even put to death? So Thomas Aquinas is arguing the role of the Christian king and the Christian empire is to kill people who don't worship the God of the church. In the 13th century, the writings of the papal bulls, the writings of the church fathers, introduce a new term called the infidel. The infidel is a subhuman category. It's first used in reference to the Moors, later to indigenous peoples, anyone who doesn't worship the god of the white European Christian male. Now that we have this category of infidel, this category of other, this actually changes the need for a just war theory. Now we don't need a, a just war theory to justify going to war. Now we can go to war based on our theological grounds. We're fighting the other. We're fighting the enemies of Christ. So it's out of this environment that in 1452, Pope Nicholas V writes out the words, invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Convert him to their use and profit. This papal bull, along with other papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493, collectively become known as what we call the Doctrine of Discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery is essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever land you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are less than human and the land is yours for the taking. This is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the continent, and enslave the African people. They weren't human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world that's already inhabited by millions and claim to have discovered it. If you think about it, you cannot discover lands already inhabited. If you don't believe me, leave your car keys, your smartphones, your cell phones out. I and my Lenape friends will come by and discover them for you. <laughs> Clearly, this is not discovery, right? This is stealing. This is conquering. This is colonizing. The fact that to this day we honor Columbus as the discoverer of America reveals the implicit racial bias of the nation, which is that native peoples, indigenous peoples, are not fully human. This makes the doctrine of discovery a white supremacist doctrine that is directly rooted, it's the fruit of a church that has prostituted itself out to the empire. Now, the challenge with this doctrine is it's been embedded into the foundations of our nation. So in 1763, King George draws a line down the Appalachian Mountains, and he says to the colonies over here that they no longer have the right of discovery of the empty Indian lands west of Appalachia. This upset the colonists. They wanted access to those lands. So a few years later, they write a letter of protest. In their letter, they accuse the king of raising the conditions of new appropriations of land. They go on in the letter to state that he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages. They signed their letter on July 4th, 1776. Literally 30 lines below the statement, all men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. Making it very clear, the only reason our founding fathers used this inclusive term, all men, because they had a very narrow definition of who was actually human. This makes the Declaration of Independence a systemically white supremacist document that assumes the dehumanization of indigenous peoples. Now, a few years later, our founding fathers wrote another document. They started this one with the words, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. This, of course, is the preamble to the Constitution. Well, if you keep reading this Constitution, just a few lines further, Article 1, Section 2, 
Article 1, Section 2 is the section of the Constitution that defines who this Constitution was written for, who is and who is not protected by this Constitution. Article 1, Section 2, if we read it, the first thing we have to know is it never mentions women. Okay, this is important because at this time women were not allowed to vote. And if you read the Constitution from the preamble through the final amendment, you will notice that there are 51 gender-specific male pronouns who can run for office, who can hold office, even who is protected by this Constitution. 51 gender-specific male pronouns, not a single female pronoun is used. Second, natives are specifically excluded, and Africans are counted as three-fifths of a person. So who does that leave? White, landowning men. White landowning men of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to white landowning men and white landowning men's posterity do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States. We have to realize the purpose of the Constitution is to protect white landowning men. That's why we have it. So today, women earn 70, 75 cents to the dollar, correct? This shouldn't surprise us. The Constitution is working. Our prisons are filled with people of color. This shouldn't surprise us. The Constitution is working. In 2010, the Supreme Court sides with Citizens United and rules that corporations now have the same rights to political free speech as individuals. This opens the door for super PACs, unlimited contributions to candidates, this shouldn't shock us. The Constitution is doing exactly what it was designed to do. It's protecting the interests of white landowning men. Now maybe we're thinking, wait, we, we corrected that, right? Well, we, we tried. So a few years later, we wrote, actually about 100 years later, we wrote the 13th Amendment. What does the 13th Amendment do? Who can tell me? Okay. So what we think it does is we think it abolishes slavery. This is what we think it says. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. It doesn't say that. What it actually says is neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereas the party has been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. So have we ever abolished slavery? Where is it legal? Prison. So it should surprise no one that we have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. For every 100,000 of our citizens, we incarcerate 693 of them. It's 110 higher than the next country, which is Kirkmenistan, and about three to five times higher than most other nations. This is comparing us to NATO nations, and you can see we're off the charts. When we break these numbers out by race, it's even worse. Hispanics are incarcerated at a rate of 831, American Indians 895, and black Americans at a rate of 2,306 per 100,000. White people, of course, are incarcerated at a much more humane rate at 450 per 100,000. So just to be clear, we've never abolished slavery. It's completely legal. All we did was codify it and redefine it under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. And today we are using it to suppress and marginalize people of color at an outstanding rate. Now, a few years after the 13th Amendment, we passed another amendment. This is the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was a direct response to Article 1, Section 2. The 14th Amendment extends the right of citizenship to anyone born on this continent under the jurisdiction of the government. It's not a bad amendment, as long as you only read Section 1. Section 2 of this amendment still specifically excludes natives. It specifically excludes women. It still makes the rights of citizenship based on not participating in a crime. So while this amendment extends some rights of citizenship temporarily to a few former male slaves, it still leaves disenfranchised huge segments of our population. And we can't forget, this is in 17, 1868. After this amendment, we still had Jim Crow laws. We still had Indian massacres. We still had boarding schools. We still had segregation. We still had internment camps. We still had mass incarceration. 
And in 1970, we used this very same amendment in Roe versus Wade, which now concluded unborn babies weren't human enough to be protected by the Constitution, and therefore they could be aborted. What this demonstrates is at the heart of our Constitution, there's no value for life. The value is actually for exploitation and profit, and the assumption is one of dehumanization. What this does is this makes the Constitution of the United States a systemically white supremacist and sexist document that assumes the white landowning male has the authority to decide who is and who is not human. Now, a few years later after this, we had a Supreme Court case. This was Johnson versus McIntosh. It's two white men of European descent. They're in litigation over a single piece of land. One of them got the land from a native tribe. The other one got the same piece of land from the government. They want to know who owned it. The case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. The court had to decide the principle upon which land titles were based. Who had the right to originally sell the land was the question they were faced with. So they ruled that the principle was that discovery gave title to the government by whose subjects and by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, and that title was consummated by possession. They then go on to reference the doctrine of discovery as a legal instrument and use that to conclude that natives who were here first but are not fully human, we only have what's called aboriginal title, the right of occupancy to the land, like a fish occupies water, a bird occupies air. And Europeans have the fee title, the right of discovery to the land, and therefore they are the true title holders. This case, along with a few others during the Marshall Court era, this was John Marshall who made this ruling, creates the legal precedent for land titles. This was 1823. So, if the Lenape were to come back and sue the state of Pennsylvania for their land back, because there's no reservation land in Pennsylvania. If they were to sue for their land back, the state of Pennsylvania would not say, no, we have a treaty with you, because that treaty was broken. They wouldn't say, no, we conquered you, because they would lose their moral authority. They would go back to the 1823 Supreme Court case, and they would say, no, based on this court case, we are the true title holders. How do I know this would happen? Because in 1854, they referenced the Doctrine of Discovery. In 1985, they referenced the Doctrine of Discovery. And as recently as 2005, the United States Supreme Court references the Doctrine of Discovery in cases regarding title to land. What this demonstrates is that the United States Supreme Court is a systemically white supremacist court that to this day has legal precedent based on the dehumanization of indigenous peoples and people of color. Now, initially, the Protestant church pushed back against the doctrine. So the Catholic doctrine, they didn't fully buy into it. In 1630, John Winthrop, Protestant pastor, was in what's now called the Boston Harbor. He was with a group of colonists. They were actually here to plant the Boston colony. And on board this ship, he preached a sermon called A Model of Christian Charity. In this sermon, he refers to the colonists that he's with as a city upon a hill. He's borrowing from the language of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where he tells his disciples to be a lamp on a stand, a city on a hill, shining your good deeds into this dark world. John Winthrop goes on in his sermon. He exhorts the people in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. Rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. Keep the unity of the spirits and the bonds of peace. These are your basic Christian church-going exhortations. At the end of his sermon, John Winthrop is trying to convince the people to listen to his exhortations. And so he starts quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now, Deuteronomy 30 is the passage in the Old Testament where the people of Israel are standing at the banks of the Jordan River, ready to cross over and take possession of their promised land. And God's reiterating the threats and promises of his land covenant with them. If you obey me, I'll do these things for you. If you disobey me, I'll do these things to you. End of this passage, it says, but if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey and worship other gods, we will surely perish out of the good land whether we pass over this river to possess it. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river, but in his sermon, John Winthrop changes it to vast sea. 
Why would he change it to Vast C? Well, they didn't cross a river, they crossed an ocean. So what's he implying? Based on the exhortation of Jesus to be a city on a hill, based on the model of Old Testament Israel, they are standing at the banks of their promised land, ready to go and take possession of them. Now, who here has read the end of the book of Deuteronomy or the book of Joshua in the Bible? What is God's command? How are the people of Israel to take possession of their promised lands? Kill everybody. Leave no man, no woman, no child, no animal left alive is the literal command. Promised lands for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. I call this sermon the birth of American exceptionalism. The idea percolates for about 100 years. This is the 1630s. Mid-1700s, we go past the Appalachian Mountains. We go past the Mississippi River. Our westward expansion begins. End of the 1700s, we have the Second Great Awakening. There's a growth in churches, a renewal of denominations. There's this religious fervor as we go further and further west. And then early 1800s, the term manifest destiny is coined. This belief that this nation of white people has the God-given right to rule Turtle Island from sea to shining sea. Now you're thinking, mate, Mr. Charles, that's a stretch. We don't believe that. Well, think back three years ago. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, was here, and he was speaking to a joint session of our Congress, lobbying against the Iran nuclear deal that President Obama was negotiating. Now, he was talking to a very divided, a very partisan Congress. They could hardly even talk to each other, just like the Congress today. He had to get everyone on the same page behind him, Republicans and Democrats. So he chose one of the most unifying themes in American political rhetoric, which is American exceptionalism. So early in his speech, he said to our Congress, because America and Israel, we share a common destiny, the destiny of promised lands. To bipartisan applause. So now that we have a white supremacist doctrine of discovery, a white supremacist declaration of independence, a white supremacist and sexist constitution, a white supremacist Supreme Court and a God-given right to commit genocide, now we have some history that we have to talk about. So I want you to think about the 19th century. Our history books teach the 19th century as our century of expansion. This is the century we add about 30 new states to the Union. So this is our country, 1775 to 2016. Every year in blue is a year that I found we were in a declared state of war, our armed military conflict against another nation or entity. Every year in red is every year I found us fighting against native peoples. This is the wars I found we fought against native peoples during the 19th century, primarily just against native peoples. Clearly this was not a century of expansion, this was a century of ethnic cleansing and genocide. It was during this century that we passed the Indian Removal Act. This was Andrew Jackson. This was the act that allowed the US Congress to forcibly remove tribes from their lands in the east to more empty lands further in the west. This was directly resulted in the Trail of Tears for the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee. This results in the long walk for the Navajo, the Apache, and the Pueblo. All told, about a dozen tribes experienced forced relocation because of this act, and tens of thousands of people died as a direct result of this act. In 1862, we had the largest mass execution in the history of our nation with the hanging of the Dakota 38 in Minnesota. In 1864, we had the Sand Creek Massacre. We had about 150 to 200 Cheyenne and Arapaho people. They were standing on lands that were given to them in 1851 in a treaty. They were waving a white flag of surrender and an American flag to show they were there peacefully. A US Army comes over the hill. Colonel Shivington of the US Army, a Methodist pastor, orders all of them slaughtered. It's later reported the soldiers parade the genitalia of the natives down the streets of Denver. 
1879, we have the Indian boarding schools. The purpose of these schools is to kill the Indian to save the man. The first Indian boarding school opened here in Pennsylvania, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of Native children were forcibly taken from their homes. They were raised in these military-style boarding schools. They were punished for speaking their languages, punished for practicing their culture. The stories of abuse, sexual, physical, mental, emotional, that happened in these boarding schools is gut-wrenching. And the last of these schools didn't close until the 1970s and 80s. I actually attended a school that was transitioning from a boarding school to a day school. I was there as a day school student. I had other Native friends who were there as a boarding school student. Their experience and my experience were vastly different. In 1890, we had the massacre at Wounded Knee. Who's heard of this massacre before? We teach about this a bit more in our history books. We had about 350 Sioux, actually Dakota warriors, slaughtered in a single day. We teach this in our history books a bit more, but there's a lot we don't teach about this massacre. So this massacre, what the story behind this was, is the U.S. Army was negotiating. They were trying to negotiate the surrender of one of the Dakota chiefs. And they met at Standing Rock. The, the Dakota people did not trust the Americans, and the Americans did not trust the Dakota people. Tensions were very high as they had these negotiations. And no one quite knows what happens, but a gunshot went off. They don't know if a U.S. soldier fired it or a Dakota warrior fired it first, but a gunshot went off, and chaos ensued. Now, the U.S. Army had four, up to four Hotchkiss cannons there. A Hotchkiss cannon is a 37-millimeter cannon. It shoots about 60 rounds per minute. It's accurate up to about 2,000 yards. They had these up to four of them there. They began raining down bullets on the Dakota people. There was a small ravine. They ran into the ravine to seek shelter from these bullets. Now, what people don't know is that the U.S. Army later awarded 18 Congressional Medals of Honor to the U.S. soldiers who participated in the massacre at Wounded Knee. One was awarded to Austin William G., while the Indians were concealed in a ravine, he assisted men in, in the skirmish line, directing fire, etc., and using every effort to dislodge the enemy. John C. Grisham was given a, a Medal of Honor for voluntarily leading a party into the ravine to dislodge Sioux Indians concealed therein. He was wounded during this action. And Albert McMillan was awarded the Medal of Honor while engaged with Indians concealed in a ravine. He assisted the men on the skirmish line, directed their fire, and encouraged them by example, using every effort to dislodge the enemy. So he awarded 18 Congressional Medals of Honor, three of them directly for flushing the Dakota people out of the ravine so they could be mowed down by the cannons. If you go onto the U.S. Army military's website, you can look up Medals of Honor by war and by conflict. And if you look at Medals of Honor for the Indian War campaigns, you will notice that there are 425 Congressional Medals of Honor awarded to U.S. soldiers between the years of 1839 and 1898. This is what our nation looked like in 1840. The dark states to the east are the states the lighter colors to the west and the central are territories are um, on, on ceded lands at this point. And this is what our nation looked like at the end of that campaign. During this same century, the dominant culture population ballooned from 5.3 million to 76.2 million and the native population shrank from 600,000 to 250,000. So we, we just, we can't say it any other way. Between 1839 and 1898, the United States government awarded 425 medals of honor for the ethnic cleansing and genocide of North America. On December 19, 2009, Congress passed House Resolution 3326. This was the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Act. It's a 67-page document laying out the appropriations for the DOD for 2010. Page 45, subsection 8113, is titled Apology to Native Peoples of the United States. What follows is the seven-bullet point apology. It mentions no specific tribe, no specific treaty, and no specific injustice. 
basically says you had some nice land. Our citizens didn't take it very politely. Let's now just call it all of our land and steward it together. It then ends with a disclaimer saying nothing in here is legally binding. <laughs> to date, this bill signed by President Obama has not been announced, read, or publicized by the White House or by Congress. The challenge we face is we don't teach a history of America, we teach a mythology. The mythology of America is that we have a legacy of discovery, we believe in equality, we have a history of expansion, we're exceptional, liberty and justice here exist for everybody, and we're a Christian nation. But this mythology runs really, really deep. Who here has been to the Lincoln Memorial? Okay, keep your hands up. Who here has been to the museum at the base of the Lincoln Memorial? At the Lincoln Memorial, there's a small museum about the size of this room. And on each wall, there are plaques with quotes and writings and different parts of President Lincoln's legacy. On one wall is a section of um, about five plaques regarding his writings, teachings, thinkings about the Union. These plaques are like four or five feet tall, about two and a half feet wide. They're marble, etched in stone. In the middle of this wall, the center plaque, is this one that says, I would save the Union. My paramount object in this struggle, wrote Abraham Lincoln, is to save the Union. It's not to save or destroy slavery. If I could preserve the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. There's a plaque hanging at the Lincoln Memorial, etched in stone, that literally says, according to Abraham Lincoln, black lives don't matter. I don't know what's more offensive, that he said it or that someone felt it fit to hang there. We don't teach a mythology, we teach a history. The mythology says discovery, the history says dehumanization. The mythology says equality, the history says only for a select few. The mythology says expansion, the history says ethnic cleansing. The mythology says exceptionalism, the history says genocide. The mythology says liberty and justice for all, the history says white landowning men. The mythology says we're a Christian nation, the history says we are the next example of what is known as Christendom. Now, maybe you're thinking that's a bit strong. I want you to think about it back to a year ago. Okay, last summer, there was a series of terrorist attacks in Europe. There was one in London where a car drove into a group of people and, and hit some people, and they were knifed. And the day of that attack, one of our congressmen, Clay Higgins, from a congressional district in Louisiana, he wrote this. On, so he's the representative from the 3rd District of Louisiana. On his website, he is known as a Christian, and he's known for his refreshing focus on the power of the individual to be redeemed. Okay, so he's a Christian politician, U.S. congressman. On the day of that terrorist attack, on his public Facebook page, he wrote this. The free world, all of Christendom, is at war with Islamic horror. Not one penny of American treasure should be granted to any nation who harbors these heathen animals. Not a single radicalized Islamic suspect should be granted any measure of quarter. Their intended entry to the American homeland should be summarily denied. Every conceivable measure should be engaged to hunt them down, hunt them, identify them, and kill them. Kill them all. For the sake of all that is good and righteous, kill them all. Representative Clay Higgins, U.S. Congress, Louisiana's 3rd District, June 4th, 2017. The problem is, is we don't teach American history. We teach a mythology. Christendom is alive and well. This quote wasn't even taken down from Facebook as hate speech. It was left up there. I want to pause here for a moment. We're not done, but I want to pause. I want to give you just a few minutes to extrovert for me. 
there's no right or wrong answer. There's no good or bad answer. I don't need an entire story. I want two or three words per person. Just two or three words. Tell me how this history makes you feel. Nauseous. Nauseous. Angry. Angry. Disgusted. Disgusted. Driven. 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 Pain. Resolved. Pain. Resolved. Heartbroken. Heartbroken. Ashamed. Ashamed. Stunned. Stunned. Sorry. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Anguish. Anguish. Sick of it. Sick of it. Wanting to change. Wanting change. Glad yeah. that you were born to say it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Grateful to learn it. Who wants a refund from their education? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, uh, kind of reinforced because I've known this. Yes. I felt it. I've lived it. But now it's out in the yes. open. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. I want to leave. You want to leave? Yeah. Costa Rica sounds good. Oh, yes. Beyond redemption. Beyond redemption. It's good to acknowledge these things. It's good to, to just, th this history is painful. There's a reason we don't talk about it. There's a reason we don't teach it. It's shameful. It's painful. It's ugly. Yes. And so, it's good to just acknowledge the emotions we're feeling. We have to understand how deep the mythology goes. So I want you to imagine with me for a moment, if you will, okay? Everyone here is familiar with the history of World War II. Everyone here is familiar with the history of Nazi Germany, correct? I want you to imagine for a moment, if you will, understanding, so one of the challenges we face as a nation is that we've never lost a war that matters. And when you win the wars, you get to write the history, correct? So l let me demonstrate this to you. What is the most singlest, deadly 24-hour period in world history that was not a natural cause? So not a tsunami, not an earthquake, not, what was the single most deadly 24-hour period in world history? Hiroshima, okay? That is actually further down the list. So we have number seven. The single most deadly day that was man-made was Operation Meeting House. This was the carpet bombing of Tokyo about three months before Hiroshima. We dropped 2,000 incendiary bombs on Tokyo overnight. We estimate 100,000. The Japanese estimate 200,000 in a single day. Who can tell me how many civilians were killed at Pearl Harbor? One guess is none? 2,000? 400? Okay. The actual answer is about 70. Most of them were killed by friendly fire. Our, an our anti-aircraft guns shooting into Honolulu. The Japanese actually didn't target civilian targets. They only targeted military targets. In the nine months leading up to the end of World War II, when we carpet bombed Tokyo, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and many other cities, we killed between three and 500,000 Japanese civilians to end World War II. Just demonstrating to you that when you win the war, you get to write the history books. Correct? We understand this? So I want you to imagine for me, how would the history books look had Nazi Germany won the war? Okay, how would the history books look? Look, how would Hitler be reflected in the history books? Hero. How big of a hero? Savior of the world. How would we teach the Holocaust? Well, Holocaust, right? Okay. I want you to keep this in mind because we're going to come back to it at the end of this next section, okay? So who is the greatest president in American history? 
not your personal opinion, collectively, who have we decided is the greatest president in American history? George Washington and Abraham Lincoln are the two top choices consistently, and since race relations have gotten worse in the past two decades, Lincoln has been more consistently at the top than George Washington. He is consistently, for the last decade or two, been chosen by the American people as our greatest president. One of the reasons we believe this is because we believe he's the great emancipator, he's the great unifier, he won the Civil War, and he abolished slavery. These are all of the things that we believe about Abraham Lincoln, and this is why we tell ourselves he is the greatest president in American history. The problem is, is we don't know squat about Abraham, no, I'm just saying, we don't know, we don't teach squat about Abraham Lincoln. I want to take you through some of his history. So in 1858, Abraham Lincoln was in a heated Senate race with Judge Stephen Douglas. They were running for a Senate seat in the state of Illinois. Lincoln had come out in opposition to slavery. Douglas was for slavery, and they were had a series of seven debates. And the, the format of their debates was their debates weren't a back and forth as much as they are today, they were a series of speeches. So the first person would open up with a 20 to 30 minute speech, the next person would respond with a 30 to 40 minute speech, and then the first person would come back with another 20 to 30 minute speech. And so it'd be a series of three speeches are the debates, um, going back and forth, and they took turns alternating who went first. And they had their, the, so their first, the first debate happened in August of 1858. And in this debate, Abraham Lincoln, who's running against Stephen Douglas, but also running against this notion that he is anti-slavery, at the beginning of this debate, during his speech, he says, I will say this while upon this subject, that I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. There is a physical difference between the two, which in my judgment will probably forever forbid their living upon the footing of perfect equality, and inasmuch as it becomes a necessity, there must be a difference. I, as well as Judge Douglas, am in favor of the race to which I belong, having the superior position. In the fourth debate, he reiterated his statement almost verbatim. I will say this, that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, to applause that I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say in addition to this, there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two living in terms of social and political equality. And inasmuch as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior race assigned to the white race. At his inauguration in 1861, he stated apprehension seems to exist among the people by the southern states that by the ascension of a Republican administration, their property, i.e. their slaves, and their peace and personal security are to be endangered. I declare I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the U.S. in states where it exists. Now, the morning of his inauguration, in 1861, he was inaugurated in March, I believe it was. They did their inaugurations a bit later, back then. The morning of his inauguration, the, the Congress was in chaos. States were threatening to secede from the Union. There was a civil war pending. And as a last ditch effort, the morning of his inauguration, Congress passed, Senate finally passed what was called the Corwin Amendment. Anyone ever hear this amendment? The Corwin Amendment was an attempt to get the southern states to stop from seceding from the Union, and so what it did is it constitutionally protected the institution of slavery in states where it existed. It stated that no amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state. So the Corwin Amendment was a constitutional protection for the institution of slavery through an amendment. 
They passed it the morning of his inauguration. James Buchanan, a Democratic president, even though the president has no role in passing amendments, he signed this amendment to show he was in support of it. And in his inauguration address a few hours later, Abraham Lincoln stated, I understand a proposed amendment to the Constitution, which amendment, however, I have not seen, has passed Congress to the effect that the federal government shall never interfere with the domestic institution, so the states, including that of persons held to service. To avoid misconstruction of what I have said, I depart from my purpose not to speak of particular amendments, so far as to say that holding such a provision to now by implied constitutional law, I have no objection to its made being made express and irrevocable. So the morning of his, event, of his inauguration, he states in his inaugural address, he is not opposed to constitutionally protecting slavery and making it expressed and irrevocable in the Constitution. A few days later, but a week and a half later, he personally, even though the archivist is tasked with sending out the amendments to the states to be ratified, Abraham Lincoln sent letters to all of the governors of the states asking for the ratification of this amendment. In 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the Homestead Act. This was an act that gave 160 acres of land to anyone who was willing to homestead land for five years out in the western frontier. In July of 62, he, he signed the Pacific Railway Act. The Pacific Railway Act was the act of Congress that, prov that provided the land and the resources to complete um, the Transcontinental Railway and the Transcontinental Telegraph Lines. This is to complete Manifest Destiny, getting us all the way railway and telegraph lines from sea to shining sea. In 1862, fall of 1862, Abraham Lincoln already had the Emancipation Proclamation written. It was in his desk. And Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, wrote a scathing op-ed calling for the immediate emancipation of the slaves. Now, Lincoln had the Emancipation Proclamation written, but he wasn't ready to release it yet because he was concerned because there were four states in the North that allowed slavery that had not seceded from the Union. These are Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware. And he wanted to make sure that those slave owners in those states were not concerned about his actions. And so he responded to this letter by stating, if there be those who would not save the Union, unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union. It is not to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. So Abraham Lincoln felt it was important. This, of course, is what's hanging at the Lincoln Memorial. So he felt it was important to assure the slave owners in the northern states that he did not believe black lives mattered. Okay? This is, this is just important to recognize. Now, later that year, the Dakota people had signed earlier that earlier, the Dakota people had signed a treaty with the U.S. government. In exchange for some lands, they would get provisions and money and shelter for the winters in Minnesota. And uh, they had signed this treaty in 6061, I think, and the U.S. government was not meeting its treaty obligations. 62 was a harsh year. The people were afraid that they were, gonna, they were not going to make it another year. And so in fall of, um, or in fall of 61, there were a few Dakota warriors, and they were out. They were out uh, riding their horsebacks, and they came across a white settlement. And almost on a dare, on a whim, as a joke, they went in and stole some eggs. And during that process, they ended up being confronted by and therefore killing a few of the settlers in that village. They went home and they told their people what they had done. And the, 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 the chiefs and the, the, the leaders of their community came together and they reluctantly concluded that they had to go to war. They were not going to make it through another winter and they had to go to war. 
And so they declared war on the United States. They declared war on the white settlers because they were not going to make it another winter if the U.S. was not going to meet their treaty obligations. So this opened up a 37-day war between the Dakota and the U.S. It was a bloody war. There was a lot of death on both sides. At the end of this period, half of the Dakota warriors fled north to Canada. The other half turned themselves in. Once that war was over, the U.S. Army immediately put out a bounty on the heads of the chiefs of the tribe. And of, the, of the, the 400 Dakota warriors that surrendered, they immediately put them into military tribunals. And they were immediately tried by the same people they were just fighting a few days ago. And over the next month, they went through these series of trials. And each trial lasted just a few minutes. They shared witnesses. They were completely legal shams. At the end of these trials, it was concluded that over 300 of them were going to be um, condemned to death. Now, because they were military tribunals, they had to be signed off by the president. So the order went to Abraham Lincoln. Now, 303 deaths was too genocidal for Abraham Lincoln. But even though these, sh these trials were shams, he didn't order retrials. He just changed the criteria of what warranted a death sentence. Under his new criteria, only two of the Dakota were scheduled to die. Well, now he was afraid that his white settlers would uprise. And so again, instead of ordering retrials, he for a second time changed the criteria of what warranted a death sentence. And now he landed on the num magic number of 39. So the day after Christmas, 1862, the largest mass execution took place in the history of America when 400 white settlers came out to sing hymns of praise while the 38 Dakota warriors were hung on December 26th of 1862. This is known as the hanging of the Dakota 38. In January 1st of 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect. Now, if you've never read the Emancipation Proclamation, it's actually very specific where it frees the slaves. It frees the slaves in Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. What states are missing? Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware. The four northern states that hadn't ceded from the Union. Those states, it says here, are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. And they didn't receive their freedom in those states until after Lincoln's death. In February of 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed a bill passed by Congress that, gave, that basically um, revoked all of the treaties with the tribes in Minnesota. In March of 63, he signed another bill that gave him the authority without negotiation and without treaty to remove the tribes from the state of Minnesota. That removal began in April. They began rounding up the people. And uh, they put them onto barges, into trains, and began moving them out of Minnesota into the Dakota territories, into what's called um, Crow Creek Reservation. Uh, it was very inhumane. Uh, people died along the way. They were stuffed into these railroad cars. They were stuffed onto these barges, and they were just transported away out of Minnesota into the Crow Creek Reservation in a period of about five to six months. In the summer, uh, late spring and early summer, um, the state of Minnesota, inspired by the bounty put on the Dakota chiefs by the U.S. Army, decided to follow suit, and they called a militia, and uh, they paid every member of their militia $2.00 and they each got $25 for every scalp they collected of the Dakota people. Um, this militia ran for a, a short period of time, a, a month or two, I think it was, and uh, they wanted to encourage regular civilians to join in the fray, and so they offered them a $50 bounty for any scalp that they collected. When the militia term ended, they um, upped that bounty to $200 for anyone who was able to collect the scalp of a Dakota warrior. Uh, and in July, early July, they inadvertently, I mean, they intentionally killed, but they inadvertently killed the one of the chiefs who the bounty was on. They didn't know they killed him until a few days later. And then they brought his body back to their settlement 
And on the 4th of July celebrations, they allowed the children of that village to put firecrackers into his ears and nose and blow them up as part of their celebration. So by September, all of the Dakota and most of the other tribes had been removed from Minnesota of 1863. In fall of 1863, um, General Carleton of the U.S. Army gave this order to um, one of the Army officers, Kit Carson, in the U.S. Army during in the territory of New Mexico. And he said, henceforth, every Navajo male is to be killed or taken prisoner on sight. Say to them, go to Broscredondo, or we will pursue you and destroy you. We will not make peace with you on any other terms. This war shall be pursued until you cease to exist or move. There can be no other talk on the subject. This began the period of what's known as the Long Walk. So General R. Kit Carson went through our Navajo territory. This is where I'm from. He torched our villages. He destroyed our crops. He killed our animals. And he moved us, chased us throughout the fall and early winter of that year um, all around our lands, never allowing us to stop or, to, or to, to catch a breath and kept us moving all around our reservation. And the, the call was, we're either going to kill you or we're going to move you down to Bosque Redondo. Um, uh, historian Raymond Friday Locke writes in his book called the, the Book of the Navajo. He says, by the middle of December, most of the weak and aged had died. There's hardly a Navajo family that cannot remember tales of an aged grandmother, a pregnant mother, or a lame child that had to be left behind when the camp had to be quickly deserted. The patrols were not interested in taking captives. It was too much trouble to transport them back to the forts. Any Navajo they saw was shot on sight. Mothers were sometimes forced to suffocate their hungry, crying babies to keep their families from being discovered and butchered by an army patrol or taken captive by the slave raiders. When I was researching this book, I was talking to someone back from New Mexico, and he said, oh yeah, I know a family, and they told me a story of the mother was hiding with her children and the rest of their family from a U.S. patrol, and the baby started crying, and the mother had to push her finger through the soft spot on the baby's scalp to kill it so they wouldn't be discovered. In January of 1864, Abraham Lincoln gave approval for the creation of Bosque Redondo. Bosque Redondo was called a reservation, but essentially was a death camp. Over the, the winter of 62 and the spring of 63, um, over 10,000 Navajo people were rounded up from our reservation, or from our lands in, in the north and southwest, and marched down to this death camp in Bosque Redondo. Hundreds of people died along the way, and um, about a quarter of our people died at this camp. The land was, the, the, the soil had alkali in it, you couldn't grow anything, there was no shrubbery or bush or trees, so there was no way to build a fire. Uh, one historian described that we were living in this land like prairie dogs would live on the field. Um, and we were imprisoned there, if we tried to escape we were shot. And about 10,000 people were marched there, and about 2,300 people died while they were there. In his annual message to Congress in 1863, Abraham Lincoln proudly stated that 1.4 million acres were taken up under the Homestead Law. In July of 64, Abraham Lincoln signed the next Pacific Railway Act, this provided, this doubled the amount of land that was available to the railways um, for creating the Transcontinental Railway, and it provided more funding and resources that were needed. Um, in the fall of 1864 is when we had the massacre at Sand Creek. Uh, the Sand Creek had signed a treaty with the U.S. government in 1851, essentially giving them the territory of New Mexico, or the, the Cheyenne and Arapaho, giving them the territory of Colorado as their land, as their reservation. And just a few years after that, uh, gold was discovered in the Rocky Mountains. And settlers and prospectors began coming in and encroaching on that land. And so it was in 64 that Shivington came in and slaughtered the Cheyenne and Arapaho. And within a year and a half, they had completely moved the Cheyenne and Arapaho out of Colorado. And they were relocated to a reservation in Oklahoma. They finally surrendered about a year and a half later. In his annual message in 1864, President Lincoln proudly declared to our Congress that um, 1.5 million acres was entered in upon the Homestead Law 
and that the great enterprise of connecting the Atlantic with the Pacific states by railway and telegraph lines has been entered upon with a vigor that gives assurance of success. Now, if you look at the history of the Transcontinental Railway, they were building it through the central U.S., but there were actually three lines they were looking at very intently. So one was going here through Nebraska, and it went right through um, southern Colora northern Colorado and southern Wyoming. The other one started in Duluth and went through Minnesota and went up to the Pacific Northwest. And then the third was in the south, and it went through the territory of New Mexico. So within two and a half years of signing the Pacific Railway Act in July of 1862, Abraham Lincoln had ethnically cleansed and removed all the natives from Minnesota, all the natives from Colorado and Wyoming, and all the natives from Arizona and New Mexico. Now I want to go back to the 13th Amendment. Again, this is what we think it says. Um, to understand the 13th Amendment, you really have to understand the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and unfortunately most people don't read the Lincoln-Douglas debates. If you read the Lincoln-Douglas debates, it's quite clear Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas agree on white supremacy. There is no disagreement there. They both agree that whites are superior to anybody else. They both solicit laughs from the audience by preposterously, preposterously suggesting that blacks might be equal. They b both get great praise and applause from the audience by explicitly affirming white supremacy. They do not agree on white supremacy. What they do disagree on is the institution of slavery. Should slavery exist or should it not? Abraham Lincoln is against it, although he doesn't really say why. He's apparently, if, like Thomas Jefferson, he's afraid of some kind of judgment by God, but it's clearly not because black lives matter, not because they're human. There, there's something else, and I don't, he doesn't really state what it is, but he's opposed to slavery, but it's not because he thinks black lives matter. Um, and so this is the, the challenge of the debate is this is the debate. So at one point in the debate, Stephen Douglas accuses Abraham Lincoln of applying the Declaration of Independence to black people. And this was his response. He said, I think the authors of that notable instrument intended to include all men, but they did not mean to declare all men equal in all respects. They did not mean to say all men equal in color, size, intellect, moral development, or social capacity. Now we have to know Abraham Lincoln's not talking about individual men here. He's not talking about this man's taller, this man's shorter, this man's smarter, this man's not so smart. He's talking about race, white people, black people, they are not equal in color, size, intellect, moral development, or social capacity. This is what he's arguing. Later, Stephen Douglas accuses Abraham Lincoln of wanting to make citizens of black people. Abraham Lincoln replies to that and says, Judge Douglas has said to you that he has not been able to get from me an answer to the question whether I am in favor of Negro citizenship. As far as I know, the judge has never asked me that question before, to applause. But he shall have no occasion to ask it again. For I tell you very frankly, I am not in favor of Negro citizenship. He goes on to state that um, it's my opinion that the different states have the power to make a Negro a citizen. If the state of Illinois had that power, I should be opposed to the exercise of it. That is all I have to say about it. So Abraham Lincoln has a dilemma. He believes whites are superior, he doesn't give a crap about the black life or the native life, but he doesn't want to make them citizens. So what do you do? What do you do if you free them from this institution of slavery, albeit progressively, step by step, but eventually you're going to have a bunch of black people running around, and what are you going to do? You don't want to make them citizens. What's, this is his dilemma. This is where the 13th Amendment comes in. You create a subclass level of citizenship. You keep the threat of revoking the citizenship of people of color at the whim of a white judge and a white law enforcement officer. You keep them in line. Mass incarceration was the brainchild of Abraham Lincoln. This was his solution to what do you do with black people if they're inferior and you don't want them to be citizens? You mass incarcerate them. 
you never abolish slavery. You just redefine it and codify it under the criminal justice system. And he would be proud of President, Link, of President Reagan and President Clinton who found out how to play that fiddle to a T. He would be thrilled at our incarceration rates today. This is what he intended. This is what he wanted. This was his goal. He would be overjoyed to learn that in 2013, we had nearly twice as many people, black people, under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system than we had enslaved in 1850. This was his goal. This was his plan. This is why we call him our greatest president. He's not a great emancipator. The unifying he did was of white people. He threaded the proverbial needle. How do you get rid of institution of slavery without threatening white supremacy? This was the debate that he and Frederick Do uh, Stephen Douglas were having. How do you keep whites superior without the institution of slavery? Abraham Lincoln thought you could do it. Stephen Douglas was pretty adamant you couldn't. You needed slavery to keep whites superior. Abraham Lincoln said, no, I think we can keep whites superior without the institution of slavery. And he found a way to do it. He is the great unifier of white people. We credit him with winning the Civil War. But the Civil War was an internal conflict. The Civil War was, was a scrap between two white people. The real war that he won was Manifest Destiny. Could you imagine had he won the Civil War but not been able to complete the Transcontinental Railway? Had he not been able to remove the, the Dakota from Minnesota, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho from Colorado, and the Navajo and, and Apache from New Mexico? He'd be a failure. Civil War is just white people fighting against each other. They both agreed whites were superior. They're just talking about slavery. He said, 1858, what is the, what we hold most dear amongst us? It's our own liberty and prosperity. He's talking to a room full of white supremacist white people. What has ever threatened our liberty and prosperity? Save and accept this institution of slavery. He's not afraid of the slaves rising up and revolting. He's not afraid of some of the country coming in and taking our land. He's saying, guys, we're going to kill ourselves over this question. Come on. Let's stay together. Black lives don't matter. That's not, that's not the... He didn't abolish slavery. He protected white supremacy. Now I want to go back to the question about Hitler. Had Nazi Germany won the war, how would we celebrate Hitler? He'd be the greatest leader who ever existed, right? How would we teach the Holocaust? What Holocaust? It's no surprise that the Lincoln Memorial is modeled after the Greek temple to the goddess Athena. We engraved his face in one of the most sacred mountains to the Dakota people. We teach that Abraham Lincoln is the savior of people of color. That's what we teach. That's a lie. Abraham Lincoln's the savior of white people. He's the one who kept white supremacy intact. He's the one who moved it from one age to another. He moved it from an explicit, an age of explicit white supremacy, sexism, and racism. And he moved it into a more civilized, implicit expression of white supremacy and racism. He made white supremacy palatable and digestible to the rest of the world. And this is why we hold him up as the greatest president 
in American history. We have this belief that these are not our values, but they are. These are our values. Maybe not your individual value, but these are absolutely the values of your nation. And these are absolutely the values of Christendom. And this is what we have to deal with. This is what we have to make sense out of. This isn't a minor issue. A month ago, not even a month ago, a few weeks ago, two black men got arrested in Philadelphia for sitting in a Starbucks. We want to protest Starbucks. We want to protest the police. We want to... No, that's, 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 that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's the fruit. The system worked perfectly that morning, that afternoon. It worked perfectly. There was a white s- store manager. There were two people of color in her store. She didn't want them there. She called the police. Didn't even ask for them to be arrested. Just called the police. And they came. Their police chief was black. He had trained them in implicit bias. They followed the rules and regulations. They called a a supervisor in to witness it and make sure nothing was going on. And they arrested them. The system worked perfectly. And we have Abraham Lincoln to thank for that. You want to protest? Stop celebrating Abraham Lincoln. You want to protest? Start teaching our actual history. These are the things that we need to begin to really, really wrestle with. We're not going to change this through a march. We're not going to change this through a signature drive. We're not going to change this. We have to change the foundations of the country. We have to address that we have a a set of collective values I'm going to finish with this, and then we'll go in. Because in in his last State of the Union, President Obama, he was talking about our need for a new politics. And in his State of the Union address, he quoted the Constitution. He said, we the people, we've come to acknowledge, he said, our Constitution begins with these three simple words. Words we've come to acknowledge mean all the people. Well, that sounds beautiful, right? When did we decide that? It sounds beautiful. Did our founding fathers mean it? Did Abraham Lincoln mean it? Did the Civil Rights Movement get us there? Does Starbucks believe it? Does President Trump believe it? This is the problem. We've never decided collectively, yes, there's people who think it should mean all the people, that's fine, but collectively, we've never made the choice that we now want we the people to mean all the people. Just saying so doesn't make it so. You don't believe me? Ask any black person or person of color near you. Just wishing so does not make it so. This is the conversation we have to have. These are the things that we have to deal with. We have to deal with this at a deep, deep, deep systemic level. I want to just go back very quickly to the civil rights movement because we have to understand the depth of the problem. So the civil rights movement was, came out of what we call um, a, a, a methodology of disruption. Correct? This is what Black Lives Matter is doing. This is what Standing Rock did. This is what Occupy Wall Street did. Uh, Disruption. You march, you protest, you you stop the flow of something, and you co-opt the stage. Correct? We've done this very effectively. I mean, this is how we got the Civil Rights Movement. Black Lives Matter is doing a tremendous job. Standing Rock did a wonderful job of 
of disrupting and, and co-opting the stage. Now the problem is, is once you co-opt the stage, one of two things happens very, very, very quickly. The first thing that happens once you co-opt the stage and you jump on to speak your message is the owner of the stage takes it back. They kick you off the stage, right? The second thing that happens, if that doesn't happen right away, the next thing that will happen is your audience leaves. Correct? They didn't come to hear you. They came to hear somebody else. If you co-opt the stage and you keep the stage, I, why would you stay? So at best, when you co-opt the stage, you have a soundbite. Now, we've used that soundbite very effectively. I'm not diminishing the work of our people to, to raise these issues. We've done it very, very, very effectively. But I would argue we have not got to the depth of the problem. And I want to use the civil rights movement as an example of that. So in the civil rights movement, so once they co-opted the stage, they, they disrupted the flow, they co-opted the stage, how the challenge you have to face is how do you keep how do you keep the audience engaged? How do you keep them there? If you're going to speak your message, you've got to find a way to keep your audience there. So once our civil rights leaders co-opted the stage, how did they keep white America engaged in the conversation? Anyone remember? Well, they did it through the moral authorities that they referenced. What were the moral authorities of the civil rights movement? Why morally were we? The Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. These were the blank checks referred to by Dr. King. Well, what did we learn about the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence? They're white supremacists. They're working fine. The reason Black Lives Matter is happening today is because in the civil rights movement, we didn't address the fact that our foundations are the problem. We tend to think America is racist and sexist in spite of our foundations. We have to deal with the fact that America is racist and sexist because of our foundations. They're working perfectly. This last election, this was no Trump's talking this is a great thing. A white man won an electoral college visit or victory over a woman. Apparently, he doesn't know the history of the electoral college. Right? The entire purpose of the electoral college is to maximize the representation of the white landowning male. This is why we have it. This is why it exists. Trump's election was no fluke whatsoever. He didn't win the popular vote, but he won a landslide electoral college victory. Why? Because the system is set up to work that way. It's working perfectly. So we have to find a way to critique our foundations. In this last election, this will be the last thing, I keep saying this, but this is going well. And then we're going to get to the part of building, but I, wanna, I want you to understand the depth of the problem. In the last election, okay, we tended to think, so what did Donald Trump campaign on? What was his campaign? Make America great again, correct? How did Hillary respond? What did she say? America's great already. America's great because we're good. That was her response. So they actually have a tremendous amount of agreement. Our past, our history, our foundations, those are all great. What they disagreed on is are we great today? Hillary said yes, Donald said no. See, we tended to think that this last election was about racism. It wasn't. The dialogue that we had between us, between our candidates was, Donald wanted to make America explicitly racist again, and Hillary was arguing, no, let's keep our racism and sexism implicit. <laughs> this was the debate we had. Now, at the Democratic National Convention, President Obama jumps into the fray. He says America's already great. Cory Booker, an African-American senator from New Jersey, he's on the main stage of the DNC. He's endorsing Hillary Clinton. In his remarks, he 
acknowledges that women are excluded from the Constitution. He acknowledges the word savages in the Declaration of Independence. And he acknowledges the Three-Fifths Compromise. Okay, most candidates are most national politicians don't acknowledge any of these things. He acknowledges all three of them publicly. But he saves his political ambition by telling this majority white audience, but these things do not detract from our nation's greatness. Really? I disagree. This is like you're clinging to a life preserver after the Titanic sinks, and you're like, that was a good ship. <laughs> you know, no, we got a mess here. The racism and sexism embedded into the foundations of our country absolutely detract from our nation's greatness. Again, remember, the way you keep a white audience engaged is you tell them they're exceptional. President Obama was a master at it. Cory Booker's learning that craft well. White politicians do it without even thinking about it. It's just second nature to them. These are the challenges. Is we have to find a way to deal with the fact that we are not in, w in any way, shape, or form exceptional. We have to find a way to talk honestly about this history honestly about the things that are going on and deal with the fact that the problem we're dealing with is we don't need new paint on the wall, we don't need new carpets in the living rooms, we don't need new furniture. We need to dig up and deal with our foundations. And until we do that, I guarantee you this is not going to change. I promise you until we change our foundations, this is not going to change. So I want to give you a few thoughts that I've had on how do we move forward from this. Now that we've spent almost two hours really deconstructing the problem and understanding the depth of it, we need to find some way to move forward. And so uh, there's a, a quote, and you'll hear this later tonight in the blanket exercise. It's by George Erasmus, who's an Aboriginal leader out of Canada. And he says that where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build community, he says, you have to start by creating common memory. I think this quote gets to the heart of our nation's problem with race, which is we don't have a common memory. We have a, a, a dominant culture of white America that remembers a history of discovery, opportunity, exceptionalism, and uh, expansion. And we have communities of color that have the lived history of stolen lands, broken treaties, slavery, Jim Crow laws, mass incarceration, internment camps, massacres, removal, boarding schools. And we have no, we, we have no common memory. And so this is one of the things that I think we need to work on. And what I'm actually doing is I, I travel the country and I'm speaking and writing. And I believe the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. A conversation that's on par with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that took place in South Africa, Rwanda, and Canada. I'm calling it Truth and Conciliation. And my goal is 2021. I think we need this sooner rather than later. So let me deconstruct this a little bit, or help you understand that. Let me give you some insight into this. So the, the primary dialogue we need to have, one of the primary dialogues we need to have is around race. And so most of us have heard this term, truth and reconciliation commissions. Canada just finished one. Rwanda had one after a bloody civil war. South Africa had one after the fall of apartheid. And because of the context of our nation, one of the reconciliations we're looking at is racial reconciliation. So who's heard this term racial reconciliation? It's very common among, um, among uh, social justice and Christian and religious advocates. Uh, it, it calls people to a racial reconciliation. Now, the problem I have with this was actually highlighted for me at a Quaker event about three years ago with, uh, with um, Stephen Newcomb. And he was saying, w I don't understand why you guys keep saying racial reconciliation. There's no harmony we're going back to. And so the problem with this term, it sounds beautiful. Many people have built entire careers around this term. But it's actually a misnomer. It's not accurate. 
So race, first of all, is a human construct. There's no genetic definition of race. It's a human construct. And in America, we constructed it to oppress and divide. So the black race was constructed in part through what's called the one drop rule. One drop rule states you have a single drop of African blood. You're black. Now, why do we have this rule? Well, blacks were the slaves. They were the labor force. We want to multiply them. The one drop rule allowed a white slave owner to rape his female slaves and produce more free baby slaves. The American Indian race was constructed through what's called the blood quantum rule. The blood quantum rule states you're full, you're half, you're a quarter, you're an eighth, you're a sixteenth, then you're bred out of existence. Why do we have this rule? Yeah, the mythology is that we discovered this land. We have treaty obligations to Native peoples. We want as few of us as possible. So we constructed the American Indian race so we can breed it out of existence. So race is a human construct. And in America, it was constructed for the express purpose of oppressing and dividing. And so racial reconciliation is a misnomer because re reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony. Well, clearly that never existed here. So after that meeting with Steve Newcomb, I, I was really pondering this. Is he just said there's no, there never was harmony to go back to. And so I'm like, yeah, you're right. So what term can we use then? Well, conciliation is defined as mediating a dispute. Conciliation can still lead to a better relationship. It just starts with a more honest starting point. And so I no longer use the term racial reconciliation. I now use the term racial conciliation. And I find just by starting the conversation more honestly, again, so much we have to do, especially in America, is deconstruct our mythology. Racial reconciliation keeps the mythology intact. We used to be great, now we have problems. No, we started in a mess, we're still in a mess, we have to make it better. And so I find using the term racial conciliation leads to much healthier dialogue. And so we don't need a National Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We need a National Truth and Conciliation Commission. Now, to st have this conversation, and I could do a whole weekend on this, so I'm going to go through this in just a few minutes, hopefully. But to, to have this conversation, we really have to prep, I would say, three or four audiences. So most racial reconciliation commissions happen out of crisis. Apartheid fell, a bloody civil war in Rwanda, a very expensive lawsuit in Canada. All these crises bring these groups together. Well, our country doesn't handle crisis well, right? We drop nuclear bombs in crisis. We build internment camps in crisis. We go to war against entire religions in crisis. We do not handle crisis well. So I don't want to use crisis to bring this about. So I'm trying to bring it about through other methods, which we can talk more about that later. But to do it through other methods, we need to really prep three or four different audiences. So the first audience I'm trying to prep is the religious audience, the church audience, the Christian audience, the Christendom audience. My, my message to the church, to the religious audience, is that we need to lament. So I'm writing a book on the Doctrine of Discovery. My, my co-author is Sung Chan Ra. He's a, a Korean professor at North Park Seminary in um, Chicago. And uh, he wrote a book about three years ago called A Prophetic Lament. And in his book, he looks at the, the spiritual practice or discipline of lament. And uh, he defines lament. He says one of the characteristics is lament is like being at a funeral dirge. You have a dead body in the casket, and it's not going to come back to life. You're there for one reason, and one reason only, which is to mourn, to weep, to cry. And so, as Americans, and especially as Christians, as for those who are Christians, and I come out of a Christian faith, so I'll include myself in that, we have 500 years of dead bodies in caskets. And they're not going to come back to life. As Americans, we have 500 years of dead bodies and caskets, and they're not going to come back to life. So the only thing we can do is we have to lament that. Now, one of the challenges with lament is, is lament um, 
when you look at the scriptures, when the people of God lament, he always shows up. He doesn't come quickly, but he always shows up. But the problem in America is it's tough to lament when you believe in your own exceptionalism. And so we don't stay in lament very long. Maybe a song, maybe really brave churches will do a service of lament. But no one stays in lament long. And when God's people, when the, in the scriptures, when the people of God lament, he always shows up, but he doesn't come quickly. So the church never laments long enough for God to show up. So there's this whole side of God's character the church has never interacted with. So I'm calling the church into what I call a season of lament. Not a service, not a song, not a period, a season. Because who changes the seasons? Well, creator changes the season. So I want the church to stay in a season of lament long enough for us to begin to, to wrestle through some of this. Um, the, the next audience I want to deal with are communities of color. I want to spend a little more time here because this is where a lot of insight will come for both the people of color in the room as well as for the, the majority culture, white people in the room. So one of the things that we need to talk about is trauma. Okay, so who here has heard of PTSD? Post-traumatic stress. It's an individual diagnosis for the victim of a horrifying event. Um, it affects you mentally, physically, emotionally, relationally. It's kind of this all-encompassing um, condition. So a soldier comes back from the battlefield and he may have post-traumatic stress or even a post-traumatic stress disorder. Someone who's been abused um, may have post-traumatic stress or a post-traumatic stress disorder. It's an individual diagnosis. And so you have to be aware of people's traumas when you interact with them, right? If you're dealing with someone who has PTSD from the battlefield, you have to be aware of this. If you're dealing with someone who's been an abuse victim or something else, you have to be aware of the trauma, but aware of, of what, what is going on for them so you can have the conversation, talk about them without getting derailed. Now, there's another trauma that's being researched, and this is called historical trauma. Who's heard of this trauma before? So we, there's actually a lot of work being done on historical trauma. It was developed by psy psychologists to understand the dissatisfaction in broad communities, specifically in the native community. So it's not an individual diagnosis. You don't say that person's suffering from historical trauma. This community is experiencing historical trauma. And so it's how psychologists understand the dissatisfaction in a broad community. Now, it's been demonstrated, it's been scientifically proven that this trauma is passed down genetically from one generation to the next. It doesn't end with the, with the group that was traumatized. It gets passed down from one generation to the next. And so I refer to historical trauma as a multi-generational communal manifestation of PTSD. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you want to deal with this history with a community of color, if you come to my native reservation, if you come to the Navajo Reservation, you want to set up a meeting and talk about the Doctrine of Discovery, and you're not aware of both the PTSD of our victims from our, our boarding school survivors, as well as the historical trauma of our community from the removal and the long walk and everything else, and you come in and start teaching this stuff, and you're going to get reactions and get responses that you're not going to be in any way prepared for, and you're going to derail your conversation and your work. So you have to be aware of these traumas to be able to move the conversation forward. Same thing if you go into an urban environment, African American community, you have to be aware of these things because it will derail your work. Now, if I had to ask you, what has been the single most cause of derailment of race dialogue in our nation? Slavery. Well, the cause of the derailment. What, what, what breaks up our discussion about it? Guilt. Guilt. By who? White people. Okay, so white people derail the conversation on race frequently, correct? So we have to figure out a way to understand what's going on for white people. Now, in most racial dialogues, white people are put into one of two categories. They're either called racist or they're called fragile. I don't find either of those helpful. If white Americans are racist, if you're racist just because of the pigmentation of your skin, then there's no room for them in the conversation, and I don't find that helpful. If I'm speaking and someone jumps up and is confronting me because of what I'm saying, 
and they're, they're responding energetically towards me, if I believe they're racist, I'm going to feel attacked and I'm going to have to defend or attack back. It's not going to be helpful. Now, if white Americans are fragile, that means I have to walk around them on eggshells. I have to always soothe it over. I have to make it palatable for them. That's not helpful either. So there's a third trauma that most of you have never heard of probably, and it's called PITS, perpetration-induced traumatic stress. Now PITS, Rachel McNair, who wrote the book on this in 2002, she identifies PITS as being like PTSD in every way, shape, and form, except instead of afflicting people who were victims of a horrifying event, PITS afflicts the perpetrators. So she looked at a very comprehensive study on Vietnam veterans. She looked very closely at this quote by Socrates, who said, the doer of injustice is more miserable than the sufferer. And she came up with this trauma diagnosis that she calls PITS, perpetration-induced traumatic stress. So I hypothesize that if PTSD has a multi-generational communal manifestation that afflicts people of color, because you see historical trauma in Native American communities, African American communities, um, uh, Japanese communities, uh, Jewish communities, this isn't just defined, refined only to one Native community. This is, you see it in all, many communities that are oppressed. So if PTSD has a multi-generational communal manifestation called historical trauma, it would make sense to me that PITS would also have a multi-generational communal manifestation, which I identify as the trauma that's afflicting white Americans. Because you cannot build a nation on 500 years of dehumanizing injustice without traumatizing yourself. And so I, just like if I'm going to go into a native community, I educate myself, I make myself aware of the historical trauma of this community so that my work doesn't get derailed. If I go into an African American community and I want to talk about these things, I understand the historical trauma of those communities so my, my work doesn't get derailed. The same way when I interact with white Americans, I understand I'm interacting with another group of traumatized people and I educate myself on this so I don't allow my work to get derailed. So one of the first symptoms of trauma is shock and denial. Do I need to say anything more about that? Okay? Shock and denial. So if you understand white Americans as another group of traumatized people, and I'm talking to our people of color in the room now, it's easy to see their symptoms. So this buried apology, this wasn't racism, this was trauma. Our Congress was so ashamed by what they did to become who they are, they can't even acknowledge it publicly. We have Texas and Oklahoma passing laws you can only teach patriotic history. This isn't racism, this is trauma. They're so overwhelmed by what they did to become who they are, they can't even teach it anymore. I call American exceptionalism as the coping mechanism for a nation in deep denial of its genocidal past and its current racist reality. Now when you deal with trauma patients, trauma patients have what are called triggers. A trigger, it's a sight, a sound, a smell, something that takes you out of reality back into the chaos of the moment of when the trauma occurs. So if we understand white Americans as another group of traumatized people, it's easy to see their triggers. So eight years of a black president was a trigger. White America did not know what to do of the optic of a black man governing from an office that was built for white people. That freaked white America out. Without eight years of President Obama, we never get Donald Trump. It doesn't happen. The election of Donald Trump was a triggered reaction by white America to eight years of a black president. Any national dialogue on immigration or gun control is a trigger. No pun intended. <laughs> white America cannot have this conversation without screaming at each other. Remember the, the, the big rally we had in D.C. just a few months ago, a month and a half ago, of the high school students from Parkland, correct? Yeah. Did anyone see the interview by Rick Santorum the next day? Yeah. Yeah. So he, the next day, he's on the Sunday news shows, and he is critiquing these students, and he says they, it's, it's admirable that they came and they protested, but they are putting off their responsibility. How dare they come here and ask 
people to do something about these laws, they should take responsibility for themselves and they should go and learn CPR. <laughs> now I want you to think about this for a minute. We're talking about shooting victims, okay? Is CPR gonna help them? When you're shot, do you wanna pump more blood? No. Second, it's like, what are you thinking? Your responsibility is to learn how to care for the people who are being shot. How dare you come and ask politicians to make a new rule? This is a triggered reaction. It's nonsensical, doesn't make any sense. This is a symptom of trauma, okay? I refer to ISIS as a trigger. Now, why is ISIS a trigger? Well, they're a group of religious zealots ethnically cleansing a land to set up their own pseudo-religious empire. Who does that sound like? It's us, right? This is why London gets bombed, Paris gets bombed, and white Americans make it all about us. That reflection is so shockingly, frighteningly familiar, they don't know what to do with it. So, as I said, one of the challenges is that we put people, white people, in either a racist role or a fragile role, and that derails the conversation. If someone stands up and it happens and begins confronting me in my presentations, and I believe they're racist, I have to confront them back, and that's going to derail the, the conversation. If someone stands up and they start weeping and crying and they want to apologize and do everything else and I have to soothe them and let them apologize and let them wash my feet and whatever else happens in these things, and that's, that's going to derail the conversation. By understanding white Americans as traumatized, now again, they're not victims of trauma. This is perpetration-induced traumatic stress. Now I have a framework to deal with them when they try to derail the discussion. So if you've ever gone to counseling, one of the most annoying things about counselors, <laughs> right, is you go, and most people who are traumatized don't even know they're traumatized. Everyone else knows they're being triggered and they're freaking out, but they're not usually aware, again, because the first symptom is shock and denial. So if you're traumatized and you go to a counselor because your friends told you you have a problem, you're not sure what to do, and the first thing your, your counselor's trying to do is they're trying to figure out what your triggers are, right? Because there's a disassociation between what happened in your current reality, and so they're trying to see what triggers you, and then when they find it, what do they do? Oh, we'll never go there again, right? No, they're like, cool, let's talk about this, <laughs> right? They're like, cool, we found something. This butterfly is freaking you out. Why? Then the next time you come to the session, there's like a cage full of butterflies in the room, you know? They're like, let's <laughs> walk into this thing. Let's figure it out. They're excited because they're like, finally, this is, we're, we're getting somewhere. We're finding out what's freaking you out so we can actually talk about the problem so we can get past this. So this is what's helpful about understanding white Americans is traumatized. When they get triggered, and they get triggered frequently, is rather than letting it derail the conversation. So if someone stands up and they start confronting me and, and this is not right, I'm not feeling attacked. Cool, you're traumatized. <laughs> Let's talk about this. Someone starts weeping and no, I, I feel so bad, this is horrible. I'm like, okay, well we're not gonna do this here. Let's talk about this. Why is this a problem? It allows us to understand that we are dealing with other groups of traumatized people, and so I'm not trying to convince white people they're traumatized. That's not my job. I'm trying to convince people of color that white people are traumatized. So when they freak out, we can respond more appropriately. We don't feel attacked. We don't feel like we have to make everything better. We're like, yeah, there's a problem. Let's talk about it. This is one, this is, and this, over the past five years of my life, this is one of the most effective tools I've found to keep this conversation from getting derailed. See, in most problems, and who's ever heard the term white privilege? I hate that term. I never use it. 
I try not to use it. Why? White privilege makes it sound like it's a blessing that needs to be shared. It's not. It's a racial injustice that needs to be confronted. White privilege makes white people feel better. Let's call it what it is. It's white supremacy. If you want to own that, that's fine, but let's not sugarcoat it. This is what it is. I don't need you to share your white supremacy. We need to confront it and get rid of it. This is the way. So this is what we need to do as, as groups of people. The challenge is we have this belief that we have white people up here and the rest of us down here, and we're trying to come up here so we can have a conversation about this history. Well, this is, this is adhering to the myth, to the lie of white supremacy. This isn't true. This is a myth. This is a mythical land up here. White privilege, white supremacy is a mythical land. It's not true. We need to have an eye-to-eye -eye conversation. We need to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. But we have to have it down here in the cesspool of trauma the rest of us live in. Here's where we're going to have the conversation. Here's where we're going to be peers. Here's where we can talk eye-to-eye -eye and one-on-one. -on -one. And so by, by using this understanding of trauma, it actually helps white people to self-select if they want to engage the conversation. Because then they can come down here and acknowledge, yeah, this is a mess. And uh, again, they're not victims. I don't let that, this, this is not about being a victim of trauma. This is about you experience, you respond, you have the symptoms of trauma. And if by understanding that, we can help to better engage the conversation. And so that's my work, it's the people of color. I'm not trying to convince white people they're traumatized. I want to convince people of color that white people are traumatized so we don't let the conversation get derailed. The other group of people I want to engage with is Native peoples. My message to Native peoples is that we are not the helpless victims of an oppressive colonial government. We are the host people of the land. And we have to act like the hosts. I loved what happened at Standing Rock. I loved it. It wasn't successful, but I loved it because for the first time in the history of this continent, we had hundreds of tribes and tens of thousands of Native people coming together, deeply committed to prayer, to ceremony, and to listening to the wisdom of our elders. We came in a collective voice, told this nation of immigrants, undocumented immigrants, that you can't drink oil. If you want to live here, you have to learn to think and learn from seven generations behind you and plan for seven generations ahead of you. I love the way our Native communities came together at Standing Rock in a beautiful way as the host people of this land. One of the most effective tools I've been able to use to invite people into this conversation. I lived for over a decade on the Navajo Reservation with my family. For three years, we lived in a very remote section of our reservation. We lived in a one-room hogan, a third the size of this room, dirt floor, log walls. Our community had no running water, no electricity. Probably a fourth to a fifth of our, native, our Navajo people live that way today. We were there about 15 years ago. And uh, when we moved there, we prepared to live off the grid. We prepared to haul our water, live by candlelight. But the thing we were unprepared for is that it felt like we dropped off the face of the earth. We learned very quickly that the primary, primarily the only non-natives who come to Indian reservations are those who come to take our picture, are those who come to give us charity. Almost nobody comes for the sake of just having a conversation and getting to know us. And as we lived there, the longer we lived there, I began to feel this very oppressive and insecure feelings. As I learned more of the history, I began to feel more and more insecure as a Native person. And I would try to talk to my, my non-Native friends about it, but they, we could only talk on the phone or email because they never came to the reservation. And every time we'd have this conversation, I would find myself getting angrier and angrier and angrier until I'd have to hang up the phone or start screaming. 
So I learned how to disconnect and try to um, uh, disconnect from the conversation emotionally so I could stay engaged longer. And when I started doing that, I could stay engaged longer, but then my friends would start getting more and more defensive. We didn't steal your land. We didn't do this. We're not going to do this. And soon they would hang up the phone. I was trying to find a way to how do we have this conversation? And I was writing a letter one day to my friend for like the 10th time trying to get them to understand how it felt to be Native American and live in the United States of America. And I said, you know, our Native communities, it feels like we're this old grandmother who has a very large and a very beautiful house. And years ago, some people came into our house and they locked us upstairs in the bedroom. Today, our house is full of people. They're sitting on our furniture. They're eating our food. They're having a party inside our house. They've since come upstairs and they've unlocked the door to the bedroom, but it's much later. We're tired, we're old, we're weak, and we're sick, so we can't or we don't come out. But the thing that hurts us the most, the thing that causes us the most pain, is that virtually nobody from this party ever comes upstairs, seeks out the grandmother in the bedroom, sits down next to her on the bed, takes her hand, and simply says, thank you. Thank you for letting us be in your house. I started sharing that, and I would have some of my Native elders and community members come up to me and say, I've lived on this reservation all my life. I've never been able to articulate how it feels, and you hit the nail on the head. I'd have non-Natives coming up and saying, how do I say thank you? How does my family, how does my community, how does my city, my nation express gratitude to the indigenous hosts of this land? Now we're having a very, very different conversation. Because now we're talking about what I would call this reversal of roles. And this is the problem that we have as a nation, which is we have a nation of 350 undocumented immigrants. People who've come here, they've never asked for, nor have they ever been given permission to be here. Not by other white people, by native peoples. And they live here acting like they own the place. Meanwhile, we have about four to five million natives marginalized, off on the reservation, acting like unwanted guests in someone else's home. We have to reverse these roles. I was walking one day, this was about 15 years ago, I was out herding sheep with one of the men in our community. He's a boarding school survivor. He speaks better Navajo than English. And we were walking through the fields one day, and President Bush was in office, and he was starting the dialogue on immigration reform. And I said to my friend, I said, you know, most of the nation's talking about this now. I said, How, what are your thoughts? I'm curious. What do you think we should do about immigration reform? And he said, well, there's already so many of them here maybe we shouldn't worry about borders anymore. Now, if you're anywhere else in the country, you're assuming he's talking about the 14 million undocumented immigrants who came over the southern border. Because we're on a reservation, because he's a boarding school survivor, because we're both native, you have to at least pause and ask and say, did he mean the 14 million or the 300 million? And I love the ambiguity so much, I didn't even ask him to clarify. I'm like, this is perfect. <laughs> And I started telling people, without natives at the table, our country is incapable of comprehensively and justly reforming immigration law. Without natives at the table, all we have is one generation of undocumented immigrants trying to figure out to do with another generation of undocumented immigrants, and there's no integrity in the conversation. If we want to change this law, we need to invite the indigenous hosts of this land to the table and ask, what does it look like to bring in outsiders into this space? If I were to go around the room, I don't know if it's straight without this room, but most rooms around the country and ask people to identify who are you, most Americans would give us their profession. I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse, I'm a Wall Street person, I'm a psychologist, I'm a student, I'm unemployed, whatever. If you go into most native communities and ask people, who are you? We're going to do what happened last night, what I did today. These are my relatives. These are my clans, this is my grandma, this is my grandfather, this is my family. So we have a nation of undocumented immigrants who identifies themselves occupationally. And what's their biggest fear about immigration? 
taking our jobs. And we have a group of indigenous people who identify themselves relationally. What do you think bringing us to the table will add to the conversation? Rather than just getting a green card, how do we, how do we relationally bring people into this community? So this is, these are the things that we need to start thinking about differently for this beginning to take place. And I'm, you know, I, like I said, I can go on and on and on, but I'm convinced that we need to find a way to create this common memory. We don't have it right now, and it's killing us. And I'm, I'm absolutely convinced we need this national dialogue on race, gender, and class, and we need it sooner rather than later. We're going to destroy ourselves if we don't have this quickly. My goal is 2021. My website is wirelesshogan.com. My Facebook is Mark Charles Wireless Hogan. All my other social media is Wireless Hogan. Um, I welcome you to follow me, to find me online, and uh, I'm more than happy to, to engage and answer questions and have conversation. Um, there's an article up here. This is one of the articles that I, I have on my website. You can't read the top line, unfortunately, but the name of this article is what if we struck racism and sexism from the Constitution? What if we actually abolished slavery and added two simple words articulating a value for life? And I have this article is a copy of the Constitution. I didn't amend it, I edited it. <laughs> there are 51 gender-specific male pronouns. I changed them to gender-neutral or proper nouns. I use the strike-through font to take out the clause in the 13th Amendment. We don't need to amend that. We need to just edit it out. We never should have said this. And so I, I, I've edited the Constitution to remove the racism, the sexism, and I added two words to the preamble. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, value life, ensure domestic tranquility. If you read the Constitution, and most people have never read it, there is nothing in there that articulates a value for life. And I think this is something we need to add to that. We need to have in there a stated collective value for life. This doesn't mandate we do this or we do that, but it brings it into the discussion. Right now, a corporate board can be sued for not maximizing the profit of their shareholders. And this is killing the environment. We need a corporate board that's able to be sued because they are not holding a value for life. If we want to live here beyond our children, we need to make these kind of changes. Thank you very much. It's been my honor to be with you.